Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for um, having me here, and also thanks for coming to this section. Uh, I'm Duncan. Uh, I'm from the Hong Kong-based um, blockchain development firm called CryptoBlock. Um, so we have presence in Singapore as well. And uh, today, what I would like to share with everybody um, is actually a bunch of experience and also some of our solutions um, to some of the blockchain uh, production ready uh, systems about what kind of challenges we have and what those solutions we have. And I, actually I would like to share with you those solutions and the purpose is, is that after the talk I would like to, um, to see what kind of interaction we have, what kind of solution you have and how to better improve it so that the systems uh, can be production ready as soon as possible. So to begin with, I would like to start with this map, and um, I believe actually this map has a bunch of like proof of concept, uh, prototypes, uh, pilot runs, and also a few production ready as well. Um, I know some of you are actively uh, involved into some of those projects, uh, including uh, myself. So this is actually a very exciting moment uh, for us to come together and exchange our ideas. Um, but the thing is that while we are working on different kinds of like prototypes or pilot runs or even towards the production, we always keep asking ourselves uh, some of the questions like, what would be the good timing for us to move from the prototype to pilot run? And when can we declare that our DRT is production ready? Um, so that's why today in the coming 30 minutes, I would like to share some of our experience and how we consider a system is really production ready. So to begin with, I would like to uh, borrow a very nice decision tree um, that I actually read earlier uh, this year from the IEEE IEEE Spectrum. And this decision tree, um, the, the, the best thing about this decision tree is to answer two major questions. Um, the first question is that whether we need DRT or not. And we should actually ask ourselves well before the prototype. Right? And then the second question I think is even more interesting is that whether we are going to use a permission blockchain or enterprise or consortium blockchain or a permissionless blockchain or public blockchain. So if you just look at all those wires, like uh, those, those uh, directions, and what we think which is uh, very important uh, is to see whether we want to have data access control. Uh, I mean the access control on the data as well as the access control on what kind of entity um, can access the particular blockchain or not. Right. So I would like to um, go through it a little bit faster and if you are interested in finding out more, um, I would like to recommend everybody to go through this decision tree and see which um, rectangle you are going to fall into and hopefully we are not falling into that, the leftmost one. So the next thing is that for sharing some of our experience, especially the challenges and solutions, I would like to use one use case like the trade finance that we are working on and try to explain to um, all the folks over here about what kind of challenges we have encountered and how we solve those problems. So a little bit about the background of trade finance. We know back uh, the trade finance is a huge market globally, uh, 16 trillion US as the market size by, uh, in 2016. And then revenue is talking about 36. And the expected revenue will go up to uh, 44 billion um, under the assumption that there is no trade war, maybe. So uh, we really don't like uh, trade war here. So about trade finance, uh, if you just check about this trade finance, we know there are so many different kinds of trade finance systems like letter of credit, standby LLC, uh, open account, and so forth. And for us, the crypto block, we are actually supporting the R3 uh, Voltron consortium. Um, we, uh, we are the, the guys behind this uh, HSBC Voltron 1 campaign, and also we are behind um, the Voltron X uh, R3 consortium trade finance system. Uh, we also have another trade finance platform which, which is called Atlas, which is an open account trade finance system. So for all those systems, um, our mission 
is to build this kind of system and also to operate it. So basically production ready is in our mind and we, we would like to solve all those challenges technically um, um, that, are, that we need to solve before the system can go uh, to production ready. So a little bit more about this uh, Voltron project. Voltron project started in 2016, uh, initiated by the R3 consortium. And then 2017, the second prototype was completed. And HSBC uh, took the uh, second, initiate, uh, second prototype and initiated the internal Voltron 1 development. And HSBC appointed us uh, to start building this system uh, for supporting a live pilot run. So in May, um, HSBC, ING, as well as Cargill, they finished their first live pilot run uh, using this Voltron 1. So the next question is that how to um, bring this Voltron 1 forward so that it will become uh, production ready. So about this Voltron 1 project, um, as you can see, from the user's perspe perspective, it's basically a web-based uh, system. Um, it's kind of like a centralized system. Um, but under the hood, it's a distributed system uh, with different banks running their own nodes and different corporates running their own nodes as well. And we actually encounter a lot of challenges when supporting this Voltron 1 system. And I would like to share with you seven major challenges and our solutions. So the first challenge everybody has been talking about is the high availability, how to achieve that. And we actually built that before the enterprise version was out. And the idea is very simple. We have the hot standby. But the key point over here is to make sure that all the nodes are um, residing at different availability zones. Um, for example, in this diagram, as you can see on the left-hand side, we have the front end. And the front end is connected to a load balancer. And then the balancer is actually connected to two different coda nodes, but they are actually representing the same entity. So one, we call it the hot node. Another one is probably the uh, hot standby node, but uh, sometimes we just call it the cold node. Um, the important part is that they should be a different availability zone by using the AWS terminology. And also behind those nodes, we are connecting to the conventional RDS, and we make use of the uh, HA feature provided by AWS for ensuring that the database has the HA as well. So the part that we focus on is about the coda nodes that we need to provide this kind of high availability. And in fact, the, com the configuration is not that hard, but how to make it automatic. And also another challenge that we need to come together, it's become more challenging. And the second feature is about hybrid deployment. So we are not thinking about deploying the entire system onto just one generic environment. Um, from day one, we are thinking about deploying it to different kinds of networks, heterogeneous ne network, if you will. Um, for example, some of the banks, they may like to run it on their own data center. Some others may say AWS is good enough. Maybe some other um, corporates, they say, I love Microsoft. So uh, we actually need to consider different kinds of scenario and how to connect them together. So with the high availability and also the hybrid deployment, what's next? The next thing is even more important to our perspective is about the cybersecurity. So about the cybersecurity, if you just consider about the AWS environment, and you are deploying to different availability zones, and then you can actually configure the firewall for, co for protecting each particular node. But before, besides that, we should also have the TRS, the standard thing, in order to make sure um, we have the data at transit encryption. So we have all the channels encrypted. But even more important is how to make sure we have the, this data at rest encryption. So data at rest encryption means that all the data on the database should always be encrypted. So there is no chance that the database will remain some of the plain tests there. So everything should be encrypted is always there. And if your database is being compromised, then the hacker will be able to get the encrypted value rather than any of the plain text. So to do that, it's actually just additional encryption layer on top of it. I'm going to illustrate um, a way that we, we just do it on Proscript uh, database. So 
So the way is that we, uh, we, the approach is by segregation. So we segregate the, uh, the key management and also the data into different, um, uh, different components or different um, uh, virtual machines. Uh, for example, at the left-hand side, which is the database, we always have the encrypted database. And also even the, the encryption key is encrypted and then put it at the database. And then in the middle, we have this KMS. Uh, we, are, we are making sure that the master uh, column key is always within the KMS, um, and there is no chance for this key to leak out and to propagate to any other components. And then the rightmost part, the right-hand side, is the call the note that we only have that logic to do the on-the-fly encryption and decryption. So everything is actually accessed from the database and bring it to the right-hand side on the coder node to do the encryption and decryption on the fly. So you might think about how to do search in the future. Um, that's why on top of it, we are also using the CryptDB um, for providing some of the searchable encryption over here. And also we can provide the range search on top of this encryption layer. So right now we already have this one on top of the coder uh, for making sure we have this data at rest encryption. And we are also building the search capability on top of it. So in the future, very, very near future, uh, we will be able to do the search all, all over the encrypted database, just like the conventional database, but also satisfying this data at rest encryption requirement. So besides these three challenges that we have, and we actually spend a lot of effort um, to, to build on top of Coder, the fourth one is also very important. It's mainly about the functionality, how to make sure that this Voltron system or this trade finance system can be connected to the rest of the world. Without connecting to the rest of the world, this, uh, this block, blockchain project or the DRT project is, can only be a toy. Right? It can, only, can never be a production ready. So we have this API gateway. Actually, it's a cluster of API gateways for security consideration, for reliability consideration. So the next, I believe it's also very important and we can encounter this problem from day one, is about certificate revocation. Um, the conventional implementation of Coder is that we have this certificate generated and nobody uh, willing to ask how to handle it once this, this certificate is expired. Uh, we may set the certificate to be expired in 20 years. Does it make any sense? Um, while our, our laptop will be replaced every two to three years. So it would not make any sense if you don't have this mechanism in place. So um, uh, in fact, we have implemented this um, key revocation and key renewal mechanism. Um, there are actually two major types of key revocation mechanism. One is, we call it passive, another one is active. Passive basically means that if a certificate is compromised and revoked, we just update our CRL, the certification revocation list, and put it, for example, at the dormant. And um, so we actually need to rely on those nodes to check with the dormant in order to see whether there is any out there or not. So the active one is more like a push or a notification. Every time when the CRL is updated, then the dormant has the responsibility to notify all the nodes. So it's kind of like a flush um, to the entire network, but it's more timely. So uh, right now we actually pick the active way, um, but of course in the future, uh, we also need to consider about the scalability if we have a lot of revocation, because in practice there shouldn't be a lot of revocation. Right? So the next thing is about the scalability. So but about the scalability, we are actually asking ourselves the following thing, and I believe a lot of uh, you folks are also asking uh, yourselves the same thing, is that right now all the implementation is based on the concept of one DRT node per customer. So when we are building this trade finance system, um, we are actually hitting some of the scalability problems. For example, we may have maybe just 100 different banks, but how about the number of corporates? Um, there will be hundreds of thousands of corporates. Are we going to set up every single node for each of the corporates, it does not make sense. Um, are we going to have one single node representing multiple corporates? How to do it? Right now, the corner node, each of the node only has one identity. So how to do it? 
I think in the future, and right now what we have is we have one DRT node with multiple identities, with multiple different keys for identifying multiple customers. And then maybe 18 months later, uh, we are going to see that it's going to be a norm that we may have one VM with multiple DRT nodes and also multiple customers. So this is what we see, foresee in the coming 18 months to go. And this is actually the part that we are putting a lot of effort to implement and for supporting the, uh, the code of open source in the future. Hopefully we can also contribute back to the enterprise as well. The seventh one that we are really um, um, excited about is this monitoring system that we have in-house. Um, so this monitoring system is kind of like a health check system. Uh, we have this system to overlook the entire DRT system, uh, the DRT network, regardless how many applications we are running on the same network. We actually have a crypto block net called CBNet, and we have this health monitoring system to monitor multiple applications, the uh, core apps. So we now have this Voltron 1, HSBC Voltron 1. Uh, we are supporting the Voltron X, the next generation of the Voltron system. Uh, we also have a property valuation system called Topaz, an insurance system called Midas, and our own open account finance system called Alice. They are all being monitored by this uh, CB um, DRT cluster monitoring system. Um, this is very cool because um, it actually gives us the performance of the system and also it's quick triggered some of the alerts automatically once, for example, there is a, a, a disk crash or disk failure or actually maybe there is any degrade of the performance, um, maybe because of some attacks or maybe some bugs uh, on the smart contract. Uh, we can actually monitor by using this uh, monitoring system. So I'm just listing out seven major challenges. Actually, we have tons of challenges that uh, we have solved or are waiting to solve. And I hope that in the future, I can also share some other challenges uh, with you. But let me summarize a little bit over here. Is that uh, for all these challenges, uh, we right now have solutions. It may not be perfect, but at least we, we have the um, the, uh, we call it the high standard uh, solution, a very efficient solution to build it. And um, I would also like to give a little bit teaser about what we are working right now, um, which is, I believe, is also very important and going to be a very hot topic, especially uh, for the consortium blockchain in the coming months, uh, which is the interledger connectivity part. So the interledger connectivity is not just limited to coder system but we are also considering about other DRT infrastructures as well. Uh, some of the challenges, in a general term, we call it how to standardize the thing. Um, when we look into the technical detail, uh, we will actually look into how to handle the compatibility problem among the CAs and also those crypto algos, algorithms and how to make sure that they are compatible with each other. Yeah. There are also other things and I would like to uh, share with you in the future about what we are doing on uh, Interlector as well. So another project I would also like to share with you is called this Topax, which is also running on the same DRT network. And Topax is a property valuation system. And if you want to find more information about this Topax, it's actually on the R3 marketplace. So uh, uh, please feel free to go there and find out more about this Topax system. So the second part of my presentation over here is that while I was told to have this opportunity to share with you about all those um, exciting uh, development, um, especially when moving from pilot to production, and we always keep asking about um, what's next, right? If we have a production ready, what's next? So that's the part we call it the beyond, pilot production and beyond. And today I would like to introduce a concept um, about the beyond part, uh, which is called accountable privacy. So accountable privacy, this concept is not new, and also it's related to the privacy. So let me talk about the privacy first, and then talk about what we mean by accountable privacy. So about privacy itself, we you know it's the basic. 
we need, uh, for example, if we go to the supermarket and buy some stuffs, um, that's not a secret. But we also ask ourselves, do we necessarily want everybody to know what we bought? Probably not. And this is, that's why I think privacy is a basic need. Um, some other concrete example, for example, on trade finance, do we really need to um, let the entire DRT system know about my, um, my transaction volume? So these are the side channel information that we don't want to, um, to, to publish. Or, for example, on tokenization or central bank cryptocurrency, privacy is, is, is even more important. For example, when we are talking about tokenization, do we really want to let everybody know that how many tokens in my wallet? Probably no. So privacy is actually very, very, very important. But um, when we are talking about privacy, what exactly we mean by privacy? Um, I believe there are two aspects about privacy. The first aspect is about the identity privacy, about the sender and receiver information. The second part of the privacy is mainly about the transaction information, like how much we transfer or what's the volume um, in it. So actually there are two aspects of privacy and we call it full privacy if we can have this kind of privacy protection for both of these, um, these aspects. Privacy itself may not be that desirable if we don't have accountability. So if we cannot audit it or if we cannot put anybody in account, accountable for, it may not be that useful. Just think about in the cryptocurrency world, we have Monero, we have Zcash, we have Dash, uh, a bunch of private coins. And we always think about, uh, well, privacy is a default, it's a basic need, but how about um, some other things? For example, how to make sure people are using it in the right way. And accountability brings in over here. We want to have privacy to the public, but we also like to have some kinds of accountability for those people that are using this platform. So over here, this is our definition about account accountable privacy. What we mean is that we would like it to be untraceable and unlinkable to peers or the public. When we use it, for example, for tokenization, we would like to keep our wallet private. We don't want our peers or the public um, to know how many tokens are in our wallet. But at the same time, we would like it to be a little bit traceable, somewhat traceable or linkable to some of the authorities, for example, or for the regulatory bodies in a controlled, in a controlled um, uh, fashion. So if you think about how to implement this kind of accountable privacy, we are thinking about Coder Observer Node. So the idea behind the Coder Observer Node is basically like a sync uh, for getting a copy of the transactions. But we are not at the privacy, uh, we, we don't have the privacy support yet. So how to add in this privacy while well, we already have this kind of accountability infrastructure? So that's the question we are asking. And today I would like to introduce a cryptographic primitive that we have right now. And we make use of this cryptographic primitive to achieve accountable privacy on Coder. And this, this cryptographic primitive is called the linkable ring signature. So let's think about, let me give a brief, very brief introduction to this linkable ring signature. So just think about the signature itself, the standard signature itself. Um, it's actually illustrated like that. It's a very simple concept. We have the message, we have the real sign as private key, and we have this engine, the algorithm, which is the signature generation algorithm. And this algorithm will generate a signature. And then once this signature is generated, then to verify whether this signature is correct or not, we need three inputs. The signature itself, the message itself, and also the corresponding public key of the claimed signer. And then this algorithm called signature verification algorithm is going to tell us yes or no, or one or zero, to see whether this signature is valid or not. So linkable ring signature borrow this idea, but complicate it a little bit. So when we do the signature generation, it's not just one single private key 
in the formula, we actually put in a bunch of um, public keys as well. So we put in public key one, two, three, all the way, say, to N um, in the generation of this, of this signature. And when we do the signature verification, we also bring in the corresponding set of public keys. So the input of this signature gen, uh, verification will become the message, the signature, we call it the ring signature, and also a set of public keys. And then the signature verification engine will still tell whether it is valid or not. If it is valid, it means that one of the signers identified by this set of public keys is the real signer. But you can't tell who is the real signer among these N potential signers. So that's the linkable ring signature part. And you are actually hiding yourself within that set of public keys. And there is no way for you to tell which one is the real signer among these N different public keys. But one more interesting feature about this linkable ring signature is that if the same signer generates two signatures on the same message, then everybody can tell who's the real signer. So which means the identity is linkable if the real signer double spent. So this is actually a very great feature for us to prevent against double spending by using this linkable ring signature while at the same time we can achieve privacy. In fact, linkable ring signature is not new. Uh, back to 14 years ago, I and um, some of my co co um, collaborators, we actually published this notion. And we have no idea how useful it is. We just published for publication. And in 2013, uh, there was a white paper called Crito Note coming out. Um, they make use of this, this linkable signature. And this is actually um, the white paper for Monero the private coin. So that's actually a genius way to make use of this um, linkable ring signature technology for achieving privacy for cryptocurrency. And then early this year, I together with uh, some of my collaborators uh, published another white paper um, talking about how to achieve accountable privacy um, on the um, cryptocurrency world. And we found out that actually this, the same, the very same technique can be applied to CODA as well for achieving accountable privacy on CODA as well. So we believe this one is a very exciting uh, thing to do. And right now we already have our first prototype ready. And besides that, we would like to have the post-quantum ready as well. Um, early on, uh, the R3 folks are talking about post-quantum. I believe this is the right time for us to uh, upgrade ourselves uh, from the elliptic curve, which is already like a 30-year-old technology, to the latest technology, which is post-quantum or quantum-ready um, uh, cryptographic platform. So as a summary, what we believe is that this is going to be a very important notion, uh, which is called accountable privacy. Uh, we believe by using decoders observer node together with linkable ring signature and a few cryptographic primitives, we can achieve accountable privacy in a very efficient way. And here's a summary about the challenges that I just mentioned and also the account privacy. So right now we are focusing on supporting coder on different kinds of trade finance, property validation, and, uh, and also insurance uh, applications as well. And we are also building this um, technology called accountable privacy. I hope that next time um, you will be able to have, it, have a try of our um, open source. We are going to make it open source for everybody to have a try. So um, last but not least, we are also hiring. Uh, we have our base in Hong Kong, and we also have our presence in Singapore, and we are also expanding to London. So if you are interested in joining this uh, dynamic and new company, please let me know. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, so there's quite a lot of questions, actually, <laughs> for you. That's good. <laughs> so we start at the top. Uh, got a few minutes. So 
so I think you answered earlier, are you running open source Corda or Corda Enterprise? So we are running the Corda open source um, and we are also supporting the enterprise. But at this moment, we are mainly using the open source at the, at the moment. And in the next generation, Voltron X, we're actually looking into the enterprise and see what kind of things that we can work together. For example, the high availability is already there. And we actually don't need to use our own solution. I believe our solution is almost the same as the enterprise version as well. Yeah. Great. Um, security and vulnerability concern uh, with Java 8 no longer uh, will no longer be supported by January, the twen uh, January 2018. Is that 2019 or 2018? Right. Um, how do you mitigate that concern going to production? Um, so he's talking about security and vulnerability concerns with Java 8. Um, how do you um, that? Okay, so our pick is the following. This is not a one particular problem. Uh, it's actually an industry-wide problem. So for us, we, what we believe is that we can always find some other ways to uh, add in some multiple security layers uh, for mitigating uh, this problem. And also, um, in fact, there are some good compilers that we can share after offline that we can actually make use of this kind of rigorous formal verification. Uh, for mitigating this kind of security loophole in the future as well. Uh, That's quite an interesting question. How many uh, TPS or transactions per second can process your project and if, it's, and if it is enough for production? So have you done a performance test? And okay, that's a very good question. Uh, about the, the uh, transaction per second for our applications right now, it's not a big issue. Just think about the trade finance um, but right now, we are not talking about like hundreds or thousands of transactions per second. We might be talking about just hundreds of thousands of transactions per hour or per day. So that's actually not an issue at the moment. Um, but in the future, and also we are adding the additional, for example, uh, encryption layer on top of it. Definitely there will be a little bit of overhead. But that's also manageable because we can actually make use of some hardware accelerator to do it for some of the data centers, but not for all the hybrid deployment scenario. Um, so for us, we are not focusing on the, uh, the throughput or the, um, the performance issue at the moment, but we are actually just making sure that for those applications we are working on, uh, we have those challenges settled. Um, for fast payment, for example, in the future, we really need to address the uh, TPS issue. Um, but we always think that there will be some additional ways or additional modules that we can add on in order to solve that. For example, um, for the payment, um, you guys may know about the Lightning Protocol. Um, if you have a dedicated sender and receiver, you can reach more than, say, 10,000 transactions per second easily. Um, so it's really application dependent. If you have an application in mind, and if you have a TPS as an objective, I believe we can always find some way technically to solve it. But the key point over here is that what is the pain point that we are trying to solve and how we are going to use DRT to solve those problems. Amazing. Um, uh, how do you run, so a few people have asked this actually, uh, how do you run multiple identities on one quarter node? Yeah, so about this part, right now we are actually uh, making a big change about on the open source. Um, so first of all, we support multiple keys, multiple identities. Uh, the second thing is that we are actually segregating it. So logically, it's kind of like different DRT node, but participating node, but actually they are just running on the same instance. Um, so for that one, maybe offline, I can explain a little bit more about the technical detail. Um, we have actually run out of time, um, okay. but feel free to contact Dr. Wong. Um, I think you've got yeah. your own contact. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks.